Hello, everyone, and welcome to my fifth episode, fifth chapter of Witcher Book Club. This is a series where I go through the Witcher books. I'm starting with Blood of Elves um, in the Witcher saga, and each episode I go through a chapter and just talk about it, review it, talk about my favorite things. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Witcher series, if you didn't know that already, if you're new to the channel. And so I thought doing a little book club style video series would be a lot of fun. And in general, I just kind of wanted to reread The Witcher books anyway. So I was like, why don't I not make a YouTube series on it and I can share my thoughts with you and you can share your thoughts with me in the comments. I had set a personal goal for myself to upload all the chapters of Blood of Elves before season two of The Witcher Netflix released, but Unfortunately, that couldn't happen. Being that I have a full-time job that is my main priority in my day-to-day -day, and all of this content creation stuff is what I do on the side, uh, I just had to take priority in, in work stuff. And then I also have other personal projects that I work on. In the month of December, I had a charity stream that I did on my channel and that took a lot of my time preparing for that. So I just couldn't get around to uploading the rest of the book club episodes. I couldn't even record them. So I'm recording them now after season two has come out and we're all thinking about season two, but I guess it doesn't really matter that we didn't cover all of Blood of Elves because the second half of this book is basically irrelevant to the show at this point. <laughs> but anyway, I'm happy that I'm able to be here and continue this series. I will also still be doing breakdown videos of every episode of season two. I already have my episode one uploaded, so you can go ahead and check that out, or you can check out my full general thoughts on season two video. Those are both out. Uh, so the next video that I record after this one will be episode two, and I'll kind of do every other video that I record will be book, then show, book, then show, to kind of break it up a little bit. Last thing, normally I do like to sit at my cozy chair and record on my nice DSLR camera, but there is a cat on my chair right now, so I cannot move her. That would be absolutely rude to move Minnie. So I was like, I guess I'm recording this episode at my PC today, which is fine. So we're here now. So let's go ahead and jump into chapter five of Blood of Elves. So chapter five of Blood of Elves is a pretty big shift from the last few chapters we reviewed. We have a time skip and it opens with Geralt on his own, traveling on a boat to Oxenfurt. Ciri has been delivered to the temple of Meletile and Triss is, well, we don't know where Triss is actually. We'll never know why Triss got so horribly sick in the last chapter. <laughs> Andrei Sapkowski never tells us. <laughs> so Geralt too is traveling uh, as the hired protection. We later learn in the chapter is the Malat Malatius and Grok company, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And there's a colorful cast of individuals traveling with him on this boat. There's a snotty nosed kid and his mother who doesn't seem to care that he is getting into trouble and being rude to other passengers. There is the Oxenfurt scholar known as Master Tutor. In the beginning of this chapter, we get to read a few of the letters that Geralt has received. The first one is from Ciri talking about her time at the temple and what she's been learning. It seems at this point, Ciri is having more of a normal schooling life where she gets to hang out with other kids her age and learn and study. Uh, she seems to be learning about things like poetry, history, nature, elder speech. She's not doing the usual physical training that she did at Kaer Morin with the witchers. And you can tell in her letter that she kind of misses that a little bit. But I really do like that Siri gets to have something of a normal life. And it's cool that she had the opportunity to train with the witchers, but now she needs that normal kid life and needs to spend some time at school at the temple. The second letter we find out is from Yennefer. <laughs> this is the second time we're actually getting to hear from Yennefer in this entire book. We got Yennefer in the first chapter. She's only been mentioned a few times in the following chapters, but this chapter we get to get a little letter from her. And this letter, it's a uh, very famous, infamous among the Witcher community and fandom as a whole. 
It's the infamous Dear Friend letter. We learn that Geralt has read this letter at least 30 times now. And from our understanding, as we're reading this letter, uh, Geralt has finally reached out to his darling Yennefer, asking for help with Ciri and catching her up on what has been happening. And Geralt, being the charismatic chap that he is, full sarcasm there, he did not know how to open this letter to Yennefer, so he opted for opening it as Dear Friend. That was his greatest mistake. Allow me to read to you the Dear Friend letter addressed from Yennefer to Geralt, and please forgive my lack of eloquence here. I do not read this as well as Peter Kenny does in the audio narration of the Witcher series. <clears throat> <clears throat> Dear Friend, your unexpected letter, which I received not quite three years after we last saw each other, has given me much joy. My joy is all the greater as various rumors have been circulating about your sudden and violent death. It is a good thing that you have decided to disclaim them by writing to me. It is a good thing too that you are doing so, so soon. From your letter it appears that you have lived a peaceful, wonderfully boring life, devoid of all sensation. These days such a life is a real privilege, dear friend, and I am happy that you have managed to achieve it. I was touched by the sudden concern which you deigned to show as to my health, dear friend. I hasten with news that yes, I now feel well. The period of indisposition is behind me. I have dealt with the difficulties, the description which I shall not bore you with. It worries and troubles me much that the unexpected present you received from fate brings you worries. Your supposition that this requires a professional help is absolutely correct, although your description of the difficulty is, quite understandably, enigmatic. I am sure I know the source of the problem, and I agree with your opinion that the help of yet another magician is absolutely necessary. I feel honored to be the second to whom you turn. What have I done to deserve to be so high on your list? Rest assured, my dear friend, and if you had the intention of supplicating the help of additional mag magicians, abandon it, because there is no need. I leave without delay and go to the place which you indicated in an oblique and yet to me understandable way. It goes without saying that I leave in absolute secrecy and go with great caution. I will surmise the nature of the trouble on spot, and will do all that is in my power to calm the gushing source. I shall try in doing not to appear any worse than your other ladies whom you have turned, are, tur are turning, or usually turn with your supplications. I am, after all, your dear friend. Your valuable friendship is too important to me to disappoint you, dear friend. Should you in the next few years wish to write to me, do not hesitate a moment. Your letters invariably give me boundless pleasure. Your friend, Yennefer. Okay, that was a lot harder to read <laughs> than I thought it was. You know, I would I would love to see Anya Charlotta read that letter because she would do it with such prose and poise and uh, she would do it way better than me. Uh, <laughs> so this letter is just pure perfection. <laughs> Like, Yennefer is so perfectly jeering and jabbing at Geralt in the most eloquent way. The language she uses, along with the very clear, sarcastic tone, it adds a level of one-upness. And I feel like she's just stood up to him in the way that he has gone about their relationship thus far. And the constant repeat of dear friend throughout the entire letter is just the icing on the cake. Basically, Geralt just got owned by Yennefer, and he knows it. Continuing the chapter on board this ship, Geralt has a conversation with this Oxenfurt scholar, the Master Tutor, aka Linus Pitt, about a particular species of a monster called the Aishna, uh, a particular water creature. I won't lie, this portion of this chapter is a huge chunk of dialogue and, in my opinion, can be a bit difficult to get through. I think this can be a section of Blood of Elves that loses a lot of people. There's not a ton of action here, at least in these upcoming pages, and the dialogue is with a minor character, so for this section, I feel like the first time that I listened to it, or the first time that I read it, I kind of zoned out when I was reading through it. But then again, there may be others who just find 
the discussion of species of monster and the current state of the world to be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I would say for this section, I also would absolutely recommend trying the audiobook narrated by Peter Kenny. I feel like the way he brings this dialogue to life makes it way more interesting and that's, I think that's that's really how I got through it. I think like every time that I've read this, I will just revert to the audiobook rather than reading through the segment. So though the dialogue goes for many pages in this chapter and they talk about some of the current climate of the Northern Kingdoms and Nilfgaard, there is a lot of exposition to the story. And, and one thing that I do love that Andre Sapkowski does often in his storytelling is he doesn't just write out all of the exposition. He'll introduce a lot of things through character dialogue. But not only does he do that, he makes the the dialogue come to life when there might be like interjections where like this little snotty nosed kid comes in and says something and they're like, go away. It just kind of makes it like you're sitting there and, and hearing, you can just almost picture it in your head, Geralt leaning up against the boat and Master Tudor saying all of these things and other people who are about and you know, maybe even eavesdropping a bit in on this conversation. I don't know, he just does such a good job at bringing dialogue to life and also just making it part of the world and not just writing out a bunch of narration of this is, you know, how Nilfgaard is right now and how the Northern Realms is right now. So later, some Temerian customs officers come to the ship and everybody on the ship is getting all uppity. Geralt apparently knows one of the soldiers somehow. Geralt just knows everyone. <laughs> it's like whenever he travels, he just happens to know somebody. He knew Yarp and Zegrin. He he just knows people wherever he goes. But I guess that's kind of comes with the job when you're a witcher. You meet a lot of people, you do a lot of jobs, and you get a reputation. Anyway, the officers start asking about a young girl. And obviously this is pretty sus for Geralt. So he makes sure to shred those letters from Ciri and Yen and make sure he leaves no trace behind about Ciri. The guards, of course, end up getting feisty and the people are getting feisty back and it's a lot of antagonizing and making for a bad situation real fast. They're really intent on finding this girl, but all of the people on the ship are saying that there is no girl. One of the guards grabs the little snot-nosed kid and brings the blade to his throat, threatening the kid. While the ship owner didn't really care, Geralt, as always, showing his caring side, steps in and tries to negotiate with the guard to let the kid go and just take him instead. Geralt's like, take me instead, let that kid go, even though the kid has been annoying this entire time. It's Geralt just stepping in and being the good guy once again. And of course, right on cue, a monster appears in the water. <laughs> I just knew this was going to happen the first time I was reading this segment because like Master Tudor is going on and on about talking about this Aishna and Geralt even and interjects with all of his sarcastic tone and wanting to be educated by the Oxenford scholar. And I was like, watch this Aishna is just gonna show up in this chapter. I, I just knew it was gonna happen. So sure enough, the monster shows up and it's an unidentified monster. It's actually also kind of a comedic scene because Geralt is fighting off this horrid creature and the creature, I, I believe it pulls soldiers into the water and, and so the soldiers are dying. But the Oxenfurt scholar is totally like tone deaf to this. And he's just so excited about this new creature that they just discovered. And he wants to identify the species. He wants to name it. He even wants to name it after himself and Geralt because they're the ones who discovered the creature. And so he's just totally tone deaf to the situation and, and interjecting his own dialogue. So just this whole scene, it just helps paint the tone of this universe that it's dark and gritty and cruel and monsters do roam, but also people kind of are lost in their humanity and they only care about themselves and their own agendas. Case in point, Master Tudor only cares about this creature and his own pursuit of knowledge. The second part of this chapter cuts to Dandelion in the city of Oxenfurt, and I just love this part. Oxenfurt is described much like this college town with students, professors, and prestigious folk moving about. The city honestly sounds so cool to me. Sapkowski does go into good detail to paint the picture of this lively city uh, with Dandelion kind of browsing different shops, uh, talking about some of the taverns and the different 
regions and sectors where students study. Dandelion just loves the city. And I, heck, I love the city too. <laughs> so as Dandelion wanders about the main university campus, passing by the dormitories, Department of Alchemy, Poetry, he eventually makes it to the Department of Herbology and Medicine, where he meets his medical student friend, Shawnee. During this time, we learn that Dandelion may or may not be being followed. He notices these people who have been following him this entire time. So he enlists Shawnee for help on how to handle the situation, as it is very likely that these may be spies who are seeking info on Geralt. So things are slowly developing more and more in this chapter as Geralt and Ciri are wanted by many individuals and many folk. Obviously the Ryans thing has been a problem for a while, but it may get a little bit deeper than that. So Shani agrees to help Dandelion with his Witcher friend and more on that later. That brings us to our next scene where Dandelion goes to visit Dijkstra. And this scene is just mwah, so good. Ugh, it's just, I love all of the characters in this next scene, and I love everything about the dialogue and everything, just everything. It's, it's the best. This is the part of The Witcher that I absolutely eat up. We enter the introduction of Redanian spy master Sigismund Dijkstra, and another character that I just enjoy so much. Dijkstra is described as a huge man, and he doesn't give off the appearance of just your average spy master. He's large, but very regal, and oh, I just love him. I'm sorry. I <laughs> when I think of Dijkstra, I often think of the Kingpin from the Marvel Universe. They kind of give off the same vibes, where they're both like absolute units of people. Uh, they're also bald, or at least I always picture the Dijkstra from the CDPR games, which by the way, I think it truly was a combination of learning about Dijkstra in these books and the way that CDPR expanded on Dijkstra's character that just made me love him so much as a character. He's just, it's true, he's not your typical spy master, but he still does his job so well. Um, he's just the best at it. And he unfortunately always gets kind of screwed by Geralt and Dandelion in some ways. So Dandelion is kind of on and off serving as a spy and has worked for Dijkstra in the past. It seems like he more does it as like this patriotic duty to help them with the situations in the world, um, especially like with all the stuff happening with Nilfgaard. I think, you know, Dandelion is a charismatic person who hears talk of all these people around the world. He's trying to figure out a way how he can help and give back. So he's enlisted himself to help um, occasionally as a Redanian spy, um, but he's not really like, super loyal to Dijkstra or anything, or really the crown or anything like that. And he especially is not out to betray his friend Geralt. His, I, it's very clear that his friendship to Geralt comes first and he would not do anything to compromise that. The two of the these characters have this back and forth exchange and most of the dialogue here is just them straight up lying to each other and they, both know it. They both know that they're lying to each other. And so it's just it's just this whole game that they're playing the entire time. So I just personally eat it all up. The other reason why I think Dijkstra is a great character is because he just has a way with words. Dandelion does too. And that's what I think is the best part of this dialogue is the two of them both are word masters and just speak so eloquently. So we get a little taste of that and they both kind of insult each other a little bit, but Dijkstra does this famous insult to Dandelion that is so good, I have to read it. Dandelion, said Dijkstra sleepily, crossing the cachalots over the whale. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you thick-headed halfwit, you unmitigated dunce. Do you have to spoil everything you touch? Couldn't you just once in your life do something right? I know you can't think for yourself. I know you're almost 40. You look almost 30. Think you're just over 20 and act as though you're barely 10. <laughs> and being aware of this, I usually furnish you with precise instructions. I tell you what you have to do, when you have to do it, and how you're going to go about it. Sick burn, Dijkstra. And the minute I read that, I was like, I knew, I knew I loved this man. 
He's so good. <laughs> so after they're done going back and forth at each other for a little bit, Dijkstra introduces Philippa Eilhart, who is a court mage for Redania right now. And she is very well respected in the court of mages. She's a very, very powerful wizard. We learn a little bit later in this chapter that she's one of the few mages who has figured out the ability to use polymorph, um, which is a very important thing to know about Philippa. And she is also one of my favorite characters in the entire Witcher series. Hey! Yeah, so if you didn't know, I love Philippa. I, I believe in Philippa's su supremacy. She is the best character. I have, I've shown her off many a time, but I have a portrait of Philippa right there. So I totally just messed up my camera as I moved it, but whatever. <laughs> So Philippa is not a good character, and we will learn this later on more and more, but she's a character who has ambitions and she gets stuff done. So that's why I think she's an interesting character and I respect her. She's not somebody who I would look up to as like a hero figure, <laughs> but I just enjoy reading her about her and I love, she's another one who has great dialogue um, and she's just a very interesting character and I think one of the best mages in the entire Witcher series. So there's my little Philippa like fangirling that I needed to get out for now. Let's continue with the chapter. So Philippa interjects and Dandelion I think is under the impression that they're they're wanting to get more information about Ryan's and why Ryan's is after Geralt. And uh, Dandelion responds that, you know, Geralt is also looking for Ryan's and we're all trying to figure out this whole Ryan's thing. But the truth is there's actually something a little bit deeper than the Ryan's thing. It's actually Siri. So Dijkstra insists that Dandelion get Geralt and bring him to Dijkstra because they need to have a conversation. That's very clear. But Dandelion is not going to give that information up. He's like, oh, I don't know where he went. Oh, he went to Novigrad. Sorry. Dijkstra isn't quite getting at what he really wants just yet. He's trying to kind of play around it a bit. But Philippa goes straight for it. And Dijkstra actually, I think, is a little taken off guard by this because he kind of had this plan to subtly get the information out. But she just goes right for it. But he knows that she she definitely has a plan because she does. She's not one to just speak rash or speak things that don't have an ulterior motive or something like that. And so he knows she has a plan. She's very calculating, just like him. So he kind of just lets her do it. But she just comes out with it, and she's like, "We're looking for Siri, the young girl that's been seen with Geralt. Where is she?" And Dandelion's like, I don't know. And that probably in Dandelion's mind is a huge red flag that this is going beyond just the Ryan's thing, that Philippa is looking for Siri and Yennefer and that could be even potentially more dangerous than the whole Ryan's thing. So we learn that the reason Philippa does this is because she knows that Dandelion probably doesn't know where Siri is. But the fact that this is brought up brings up this sense of urgency to the matter where Dandelion is very likely gonna go straight to Geralt after this. And so with that, they can follow him and that will lead them straight to Geralt because they know at this point that Dandelion is not gonna just bring Geralt in. Uh, that's just not gonna happen. So after this whole conversation, happens and doesn't really get anywhere or anything for Dijkstra, who is clearly very annoyed by the whole situation. <laughs> I feel bad sometimes for Dijkstra as a character, but because I know he's a great spy master and he's really good at what he does, but we often see him getting the short end of the stick in a lot of these situations, but he's so much more than that. <laughs> Dandelion leaves and he expects that the spies might still be following him, even though you know, he asked Dijkstra to have him r remove his spies and Dijkstra lied and was like, yeah, sure, we're gonna pull, you know, pull him off. No, that, that doesn't happen. Um, so he, you know, goes through all of his secret ways of getting back to Geralt, who he knows is in Oxenfurt right now. Um, he like goes, 
kind of like a secret route that he's used to and, and tries his best to get away from them. He makes his way back to the room where Geralt is and uh, it is unfortunate because he walks into the end of Geralt and Shani getting it on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting scene to me. I, once again, I don't like to get too deep into some of the more problematic things of the Witcher universe, much like I didn't talk a lot about the Triss stuff that happened in Kaer Morhen. I also don't really want to get too deep into the implications of Geralt, an old man, sleeping with Shani, a young girl. I'm not a big fan of it, so I think it doesn't really add much to the plot other than the fact that Geralt is horny and Shani is too. And maybe it's just Geralt's just like not in the right place right now. So he, even though we know he loves Yennefer, he still sleeps with Shani. I don't know. It's, it annoys me, honestly. And because this is my YouTube channel, I'm going to be petty for just a moment here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry <laughs> to everybody for my pettiness, but a lot of people in the Witcher community really don't like Triss, and for very good reason, honestly. I totally understand. I actually am a big fan of Triss as a character, not just because of the games. I think the games, the game Triss, she's okay, she has her problems, whatever. Book Triss, especially in Blood of Elves, there's a lot of reasons to not like her, and I totally get it. People will often point their fingers at Triss for how she very strongly comes on to Geralt in Kaer Morhen, and it, it is pretty bad. But then they somehow don't also throw the same rocks and stones at Geralt for being an extremely old man and sleeping with a 17-year-old girl. I don't know what the consent things are for the time and all that, and I don't even care. The fact that he is an, a much older man sleeping with a young girl, that's absolutely like a power move there, and it's very weird. And he's the main character here. So he's doing something that is bad, but nobody ever really points that out much. They don't always like be like, oh, Geralt's a bad person for sleeping with Shani, but they'll always say Triss is a bad person. So I don't know. If you're gonna throw stones at Triss, you should also throw stones at Geralt is really what I'm trying to say here. And also what I should say is nobody in the Witcher series should be your hero. Maybe Ciri. Ciri is probably the most good character of all of the book characters. Maybe she's somebody you can look up to, but you should not look up to any of these other characters. They're all interesting characters, but they're all extremely flawed and they should not be your heroes. So stop hating on Triss, only Triss, and start hating on your other characters too. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. This has been my thesis in defense of Triss Marigold. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Dandelion does a little bit of shaming to, to Shani, but Shani doesn't seem to care. She's totally like secure in her own, you know, the relationships and everything like that, which good for her. But anyway, sure enough, Philippa did end up following Dandelion to his room and straight to Geralt. And she followed him in the form of an owl. Once again, the polymorph thing really coming in handy here. And she flies in an owl form and shows up. Hello, everybody, and makes her grand entrance very properly, uh, must I say. And she's very polite in her ways of, I won't ask anybody to leave, but she kind of wants Shani to leave. But Shani stays and uh, Geralt's like, no, we're not. Nobody's leaving until we resolve this. Philippa, first of all, also has a couple of jabs at Geralt in that, oh, Shani, you're only a third year student. 17 years old. I bet Yennefer wishes she would be 17 years old again. The conversation isn't going great because Philippa wants to get down to business and is like, you need to figure your shit out with Siri because you have no idea what this girl is. And he kind of berates him a little bit that he doesn't understand the responsibility that he has. Not only having a child of Sintra, but also what she her power is magically. And that leads Geralt to think, mm, you're talking about her magic power, eh? This isn't this isn't a Redania thing. You're not here to try to get info on Siri for for the crown. You're here for your own motivations in the chapter of mages. He's right. She totally is. She doesn't really get too much in his face about it. He you know, she scolds him quite a bit and 
that's about where the conversation goes, um, where she's really telling him, you need to be prepared for this responsibility you have. Do you think you're prepared? Probably not. Um, and then eventually the conversation continues to talk about Ryan's and, and the dangers of that. And that's where Shawnee comes in and it said, Ryan's, does this man have a scar on his face, a burn scar on his face by chance? And everybody looks to Shawnee like, huh? She knows something. She's, she has seen Ryan's before. And that's where Shawnee really comes in handy for the next chapter, because that's where the chapter ends on that little note of Shawnee bringing up that little tidbit. And we will dive into what happens with the Ryan situation with Shawnee, Dandelion, Geralt, and Philippa in the next chapter. So this chapter, uh, it, it's a good one. I, I, I think it starts a little slow on the boat, but it does kind of lead us to where the next portion of the story is going. But it, this chapter also introduces two of my favorite book characters, Dijkstra and Philippa, so I can't hate it. I mean, it's got great dialogue. It's got the dear friend letter and it's got the Dijkstra burn. So I can't hate this chapter. Talking about the Netflix series real quick, honestly, there was not a, not a lot in this chapter that we could really talk about for the show because it doesn't really have a lot. We got Dijkstra and we got Philippa, but we didn't really get the Redanian intel side of things that I was hoping we would get in the show. Uh, Yaskier doesn't even seem to work for Dijkstra. Maybe he does, but that wasn't revealed at all in the show. So uh, I, I don't know. I was kind of hoping we would get that dialogue between Dijkstra and Yaskier. The, ooh, that back and forth would have been so good between Joey Beatty and Graham McTavish. We didn't get that, but maybe their paths will cross in season three. We'll see. We also didn't get Shawnee at all in season two. She doesn't have the biggest role right now in the book. I mean, she helps them find Ryan's, but that seems to not be the case of finding Ryan's in season two. Shawnee had no like help with that. So I'm fine that she wasn't really included in this season because her plot points aren't really that important. I do like Shawnee as a character, but she's not like super necessary at this point. The show kind of went its own route with Ryan's and it, yeah, took its own liberties again with Philippa, who is not in this at all. Philippa only appears at the end. Dijkstra, you know, is kind of also a minor character at this point with only a few moments of good dialogue. So it's just a whole different, I don't know, very different from this chapter. But the chapter is in, this chapter is interesting nonetheless and where it goes to the next chapter makes it even more interesting. And that is all for me for chapter five. I will be back in a couple of weeks with uh, chapter six and chapter seven to conclude our Blood of Elves read through and discussions. So thank you once again, everybody who have joined me for this little journey. I know that my schedule is not as consistent as I want it to be, but I appreciate all of you who watch the videos and engage with it nonetheless. Y'all are awesome. So now we will say goodbye. Psst, psst, Minnie, psst, Minnie. Minnie also says goodbye to all of you and thanks for watching and see y'all in the next video. Let me know your thoughts on chapter five. Bye-bye.